The Ripjaws KM570 mechanical keyboard from G-Skill features Cherry MX speed silver switches, RGB per key lighting, and on-the-fly macro recording for a premium gaming experience. Meanwhile, the MX780 sports eight programmable buttons, three-zone custom RGB lighting, and an ambidextrous design with height adjustment. Click the link in the description to learn more. What's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. Hope you're all doing well. Today is the long-awaited part two of the Enthu Elite build, our 10,000-ish dollar system that we're gonna be building from the ground up. There have been some changes since part one. Uh, many things have transpired, so before we dive into the actual build section, because we're actually gonna be installing things in the case today, I want to quickly go over what has changed since part one. For starters, a lot of you guys were telling me to delid that Core i9-7980XE or you would do terrible things to me. So, uh, held against my will, I decided to turn this in to the folks over at Gamers Nexus. Gamers Nexus Steve actually did a fantastic job delitting this guy and uh, applying some liquid metal himself in order to lower our thermals and increase power efficiency and other good things like that. So I can't wait to actually get this thing installed and take it for a spin, especially with this ridiculous custom loop that we're building around it. Uh, it should be pretty exciting. But during his testing, and you guys should definitely go ahead and check out his video, I'll put a link in the uh, description below that he did with the Rampage 6 Extreme motherboard and this particular CPU, he found that that motherboard was actually throttling the core frequency due to an overheating VRM. So. Because of that, and Steve's infinite wisdom, I've decided to invest in an ASUS ROG Rampage 6 Extreme monoblock that will hopefully lower the temperatures on our VRM enough so we don't encounter any thermal throttling, because the last thing we want is for this thing to be super nice and delitted and all that and get ruined at the end of the day by the motherboard. So additionally, I have since done away with the uh, single reservoir and loop idea. We're actually gonna be doing two loops. So I've actually got some new hardware here, the EK X Res 140 Revo D5 RGB PWM pump res combos. We've got two of them. One loop is probably gonna be for our CPU and the other for our graphics cards. Uh, additionally about that, I, I currently have one of them installed. We're still waiting on the other GTX 1080 Ti from Asus. Uh, we ran into some ridiculous shipping mishaps recently, so it's actually on its way. Long story short, it will be here shortly and uh, we'll be able to con continue just fine, but everything's in order for that. I'm very excited to be doing a dual loop system though for the first time. Additionally, you might notice this stack of LL series RGB fans from Core here we have six 120s and six 140s with their included commander pro digital fan and rgb lighting controllers those will be situated on our four radiators here and going with the dual loop configuration we are going to have two radiators per loop so we're going to have a 480 and a 360 for each of our loops, which is pretty insane, covered by these fantastic fans, no pun intended. We've also got some new storage situation here. So we've got two M.2 SSDs, these are both NVMe. We've got the 960 Evo, these are both from Samsung. Uh, this is a 250 gig version or model that we're gonna be using as a boot drive. And then we've got a two terabyte stick. Uh, that's just gonna be for our scratch disk and uh, bigger applications, all of our raw footage and things like that if we're gonna be editing games and so forth. Uh, I may invest in a second two terabyte drive. I think we have enough lanes uh, for, for that to happen. So maybe we'll do some raid action. That'd be pretty sweet. This is an overkill system after all. And then finally, we've got the Platimax DF series power supply from Edermax that I showed off in part one, but this is just a quick verbal update that we do have some custom sleeved cables from Joey at Ensourced on the way. They are in the mail. He's already done with them. I'm not going to give too much away as far as the pattern and colors that we're using. Uh, I mean, you can probably figure out that it's going to be more or less color neutral, but they are going to be some really sweet cables. So I can't wait to show those off as well. Um, but I want to start trying to bend some tubes by the end of this part one or part two video. So uh, we got to get everything installed. Radiators, the fans. Let's go ahead and do that now and see how far we get. Oh boy, it's going to be intense.
right guys, check out the progress we've made. Looks pretty sweet. Things are going pretty smoothly. You can see that we have very little clearance between this rightmost uh, pump res and the radiator. Look, the fitting's just like maybe a millimeter away from the fin stack. Uh, it's just, uh, just by a hair. And actually the, uh, the back plate here, this little modular plate that we mounted these pump reses to, uh, I thought it supported two side-by-side -side reservoirs, but apparently it only has the mounting strips for one of them. So I actually only have one side of this reservoir uh, mounted to that bracket. You can see here, if we take a look at the back side, I actually had to zip tie one side to part of the bracket. So it's kind of ghetto rigged here. And you, can, you can't even tell from the other side, it looks perfectly fine. It might be slightly tilted, but I can always tweak that a little bit later. Um, but apart from that, everything's going pretty smoothly here. Uh, the fans and radiators are fitting just fine. Had just you know just enough clearance between uh, this this radiator fan and and the pump res there. But yeah, looking good. Now after I set all this up, I spent a good hour and a half just looking at this system, trying to figure out where my runs would go because. Obviously we're dealing with two loops now and it kind of makes things a little bit more complicated, uh, but I think I figured it out for the most part. So I'm gonna share with you guys my idea for, for each of these runs and then we're gonna get to tube bending. Um, so for, for this pump res, I was thinking this would control the, uh, the CPU loop. This would be our CPU loop, right? So, um, and, and don't pay attention to the fittings. They're just here for placeholders. They don't necessarily indicate the direction that the tubes will be going. So uh, this is the outlet here. I was thinking I was gonna go out just slightly over and then up, and then go straight across into the monoblock, out of the monoblock, and then we're gonna go diagonally back into the corner of the case before going straight up into this inlet for the, the uh, radiator. We're gonna come down here, all the way down. It's gonna go back, and then into that back port. Then from here, it's gonna go up, just ever so slightly, just barely above the fans. It's gonna go all the way to the end of the fans, straight back, and then straight back up to the inlet. So that would be our CPU loop. Now our GPU loop's gonna be a little tricky because it's gonna have to avoid all of the runs from our CPU loop. It's gonna get kind of messy in this area here, but, but hear me out. Uh, we're gonna go out, then we're gonna go all the way back, and maybe I'll do some like, whoop, like a little bit of uh, bendy magic, going straight into this inlet here, and then it's gonna go to both of our GPUs, and it's gonna come out this guy, another boop, it's gonna come out back here, down below, maybe back into this inlet, out here, into, the, into there, and then finally returning from the, the bottom radiator, bottom of the radiator into our pump res. So that is the tentative plan for now, as far as the runs go. And uh, you know, I'm gonna try to be flexible. If something's not working out, then I'm totally willing to switch it up. And it's all about problem solving at this point. But on that note, I think we are ready to start bending some tubes. However, uh, since I am pretty much as noob as they come when it comes to custom water cooling and tube bending, I'm actually going to call upon my good friend Brian Stroh from BPS Customs. You guys should go check his channel out if you haven't yet. Tons of good stuff there. Reviews, builds, lots of custom work. Uh, he does a great job over there, but Brian's going to help me out a little bit. He's going to give me a couple pointers that he's learned over his several years of being a custom water cooling enthusiast uh, so that maybe I have a little bit easier time figuring this all out uh, as I go about the Enthu Elite build. And maybe you guys will learn something too. All the while, I'm going to just go ahead and jump into tube bending so you guys have some nice visuals to overlap on his sexy ass voice. Without further ado, guys, let's get bending. What's going on guys? My name is Brian. I run the BPS Customs YouTube channel. I'm sure Kyle will drop a link down there somewhere and if he doesn't, he's a jerk. But I am here with my very wobbly table to give you guys some tips and also some tricks as far as how to approach your next water cooling project. Now keep in mind that some of these might seem like fairly basic techniques. However, when it comes to something like water cooling, especially if you're doing an overkill system like Kyle is right now, if you don't have the basics down, you're gonna run into problems. You're not only gonna waste materials, but you could end up with a flooded box of electronics, and that's not good for anybody. First thing you need before you even start is the right tools. Now you're gonna need a heat gun, preferably one that stands up on its own so you don't have to hold it while you're doing your tubes. Second thing, something to cut the tube with. The last thing you definitely need if you're dealing with hard line is one of these little silly silica, silicone inserts because without this, your tube will collapse when you try to bend it. Now another thing that I highly recommend having on hand is something to finish the ends of your tubing with. 
Now what I mean by that is a lot of times when you cut PETG or acrylic, you'll end up with a not perfectly smooth edge, or even worse, you could have a burr. If you insert that edge into a fitting, you could slice through the rubber O-ring and cause a leak. A lot of times when people have leaks inside their system, it's not necessarily because that fitting was bad from the factory, rather they damaged it during installation. There's a couple different ways you can prevent this from happening. You can buy this from Home Depot. This is called a deburrer, deburr, deburr. It's about $3. You could do both the inside and the outside of the tube with this. Put the tube in and you just spin it. The best way that I've found to smooth out the edges of the tube, however, is with this. This is a Primo Chill rigid finishing bit. It fits into the end of a drill. You put it into the tube like this and then you spin the drill. You could actually use this tool to make minute adjustments in the length of the tube as well as just smooth out the edges. Let's get to bending. What you want to do is make sure your heat gun is on low or medium heat. High heat in any form will cause this tube to blister. So you don't want to hold it too close. You also don't want to hold it too far away to make sure that it's getting appropriately heated. Keep it a couple inches off, rock it back and forth while spinning it like a rotisserie. If you're not rocking it back and forth, you're only heating one spot in the tube. And when you go to bend it, it'll kink. So when everything is all heated up, the way you know that it's ready to be bent is that the tube will actually lose some structural integrity and start to bend on its own. Bend the tube slowly and with even pressure. Don't rush it into place. And when it's all done, when it's at the angle you want, take it off the heat and allow it to cool naturally. You could blow on it a little bit. Don't dip it into water. That's a bad idea. Keep in mind, as PETG or acrylic cools, because the material is contracting, it does tend to go back towards being straight. Now, it's not going to snap back into the straight position. However, you might open up the angle a little bit if you just leave it. And instead of a 90, you might end up with like a 100 degree angle. In order to prevent that, hold the tube in place until it's cool. For those of you who are beginners or even intermediate tube benders, something like this can certainly help you out. This is the Barrow Bending Kit. It comes in different sizes. This one I think actually is the 16 millimeter size and I'm dealing with some 12 millimeter tubing here. However, you get the idea. You can actually bolt these down to a piece of wood so that you have them fixed in place and you could bend around them or you could just hold them freehand. They actually help you tremendously when it comes to getting precise angles on your bends because they are all marked up to 180 degrees. The same thing applies to freehand bending. If you're using one of these bending kits and you take your tube and bend it around the corner, you're going to need to make sure that you hold it there because if you don't, it'll actually retract a little bit and you'll end up with the wrong angle. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is measuring. A lot of people think that they could take a straight piece of tube, put a little mark on it, bend it at that mark, and then you're going to have the perfect distance between fittings. That's not how it works. First of all, if you put a mark on this tube, especially with something like a Sharpie, when you heat the tube to bend it, you're actually gonna bake that Sharpie right into the finish. You're not gonna be able to get it off. The second thing is that tube bends don't actually terminate at the same point that you start the bend. This is because the middle of the bend is actually pushed back about maybe a half an inch or so from where that final bend comes down. The thing you wanna do when you're measuring your tubing runs is that say you have four inches between fittings before you need to make a 90 degree turn. You don't want to measure and bend this tube at four inches. If you do that, when you make the radial bend, you're actually going to end up at about four and a half, four and three quarters inches, and you're going to be way too far. This bend actually extends the tube. And if you, if you look at it, you actually want to start bending at maybe three and a half inches, and then you'll end up at the right spot. This takes some getting used to, some practice, and a lot of patience. All right, guys, so after much time, effort, and patience, we finally got some of the runs done today. As you can see, all of the runs for our CPU loop are complete. It looks fantastic. I think the only one I would redo is this one right here, so maybe we can get, do away with these extensions. Might make it look a little bit cleaner. But we still have the GPU loop to do, obviously. Uh, we're still waiting on that second GTX 1080 Ti, so once that rolls in, we'll be able to do that and fill the loop finally and do a, a first boot in part three. 
hopefully. I think it's gonna happen, so stay tuned for that. Um, Brian's advice came in handy a lot. I used pretty much every tip he gave me, and it was a lifesaver. Guys, once again, check his channel out, and thanks, Brian, for being a part of this video. Uh, some of my own experiences, however, um, were that if you happen to cut down a run almost too short so that it falls short of a particular fitting, if you have the option to, what helped us a lot was actually sliding the radiators. Just, you know, maybe it's only a centimeter or two, uh, but that actually keeps you from having to start a completely new run, wasting more materials and time. So uh, that was a huge, huge help. Now, I also picked up this angling tool from XSPC, which would have been real handy if it actually fit the tubing we were using. That was my bad. So what we ended up having to do was improvising, drawing some flat lines, 90 degree and 45 degree lines on a piece of paper and measuring the tubes or angling the tubes that way, which actually worked just fine. And um, especially since you're laying it flat on the table, it helps it just stay uh, all the more aligned when you're uh, doing your runs. Overall, this has been a very positive experience, very challenging, obviously very rewarding when you get it right. Compared to Hotline, this is a completely different animal. We're dealing with two loops here that have to be running side by side, not interfering, and also looking good next to each other. So there's a lot more planning involved, uh, much more detail going into it. So guys, thank you so much. If you liked what you saw, go ahead and toss a like on the video. And be sure to subscribe to the channel for more tech stuff coming at you really soon. You can also check me out on Floatplane. I'll leave a link in the description below. Have a good one, guys. I will see you all in the next video.